Hello! Welcome to What the Folk for the 22nd of July. What the Folk, your source for all the folk, lore, stories, tales, and anything else we might want to throw you away. As our fairy month continues, I'm going to bring you some tales from the Isle of Man. The book I'm reading from this week is The Manx Fairy Tales by Sophia Morrison, written in 1911. A um, little background on the Isle of Man and Miss Morrison, or Ms. The Isle of Man, or the Manx, the Manx people, in, is an island in the Irish Sea between England and Ireland. It's a Gaelic culture, so plenty of weird consonant placements for us to play with, and uh, it was also one of the first places to start its cultural revival. So, sort of post-Anglo-Norman culture spread to Scotland, Wales, Ireland, Isle of Man, the Channel Islands, etc., and kind of overlaid those existing Celtic cultures. And in the 19th and 20th centuries, there was a big push to reinvigorate those local cultures. So they uh, reintroduced the languages. Um, Manx is now spoken by sev several thousand people. Um, uh, I think Gaelic's up to about 6,000. And Irish, I don't even know what that is. That's a very popular language then. Welsh is taught in schools. <laughs> Not that anyone pays attention to it. So yeah, and, uh, Ms. Morrison was a big part of that because whenever you have a cultural reinvention, you also create a national identity for yourself which requires a past. And that involves looking into folklore. That's why the Grimms started what they did. Because they wanted to create a German identity after the rejigging of Germany. But that's politics and we don't talk about that here. We just talk about silly folk tales. Uh, I should note, I can't do a Manx accent. <laughs> so, when I do my comedy voices for this for this episode, they'll be my normal comedy voices. The first tale I'm bringing to you today is Billy Beg, Tom Beg, and the Fairies. Not far from Dalby, Billy Beg and Tom Beg, two humpback cobblers, lived together on a lonely croft. Billy Beg was sharper and cleverer than Tom Beg, who was always at his command. One day, Billy Beg gave Tom a staff and quoth him, Tom Beg, go to the mountain, fetch home the white sheep. Tom Beg took the staff and went to the mountain. He could not find the white sheep. At last, when he was far from home and dusk was coming, he began to think he had best go back. The night was fine and the stars and small crescent moon were in the sky. No, no sound was to be heard but the curlow's sharp whistle. Tom was hastening home. He had almost reached Glen Russon when a grey mist gathered and he lost his way. But it was not long before the mist cleared, and Tom Begg found himself in a green glen such as he'd never seen before, though he thought he knew every glen within five miles of him, for he was born and reared in the neighbourhood. He was marvelling and wondering where he could be when he heard a faraway sound drawing nearer to him. Ah, he said to himself, there's more than myself a foot on the mountain tonight, I'll have company. The sound grew louder. First it was like the humming of bees, then it was like the rushing of Gledden May waterfall, and last it was like the marching and murmuring of a crowd. It was the fairy host. Of a sudden the glen was full of horses, and of little people riding on them, with lights on their red caps shining like the stars above, and making the night as bright as day. There was the bellowing of horns and the waving of flags, the playing of music and the barking of many little dogs. Tom Begg thought he had never seen anything so splendid as what he'd seen there. In the midst of the drilling and dancing and singing, one of them spied Tom. And then Tom saw coming towards him the grandest little man he'd ever set eyes upon, dressed in gold and silver and silk shining like a raven's wing. It's a bad time you've chosen to come this way, said the little man who was the king. Yes, but it's not here I'm wishing to be, though, said Tom. Then said the king, Are you one of us tonight, Tom? I am surely, said Tom. Then, said the king, It will be your duty to take the password. You must stand at the foot of the glen, and as each regiment goes by, 
you must take the password. It is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. That'll do. I'll do that with a heart and a half, said Tom. As daybreak, the fiddlers took up their fiddles and the fairy army set itself in order. The fiddlers played before them out of the glen, and sweet that music was. Each regiment gave the password to Tom as it went by. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and last of all came the king, and he too gave it. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Then he called in Manx to one of his fellow men, and take the hump from this fellow's back. Before the words were out of his mouth, the hump was whisked off Tom Begg's back and thrown into a hedge. How proud now was Tom, who so found himself the straightest man in the Isle of Man. He went down the mountain and came home early in the morning, with light heart and eager step. Billy Begg wondered greatly when he saw Tom Begg so straight and strong. When Tom Begg had rested and refreshed himself, he told his story, how he had met the fairies who came every night to Glen Rushen to drill. Next night Billy Begg set off along the mountain road and at last came to the Green Glen. Around midnight he heard the trampling of horses and the lashing of whips, the barking of dogs and a great hullabaloo. And behold, the fairies and their king, their dogs and their horses, all at drill in the glen, as Tom Begg had said. When they saw the humpback, they all stopped, and one came forward very crossly and asked him his business. I am one of yourselves for the night, and should be glad to do you some service, said Billy Begg. So he was set to take the password. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And at daybreak the king said, It is time for us to be off. And up came the regiment after regiment, giving Billy Beck the password. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Last of all came the king with his men, and gave the password. Also, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. That'll do. Also Sunday, says Billy Beck, thinking himself clever. Then there was a great outcry. Get the hump that was taken off that fellow's back last night and put it on this man's back said the king, with flashing eyes, pointing to the hump that lay under the hedge. Before the words were well out of his mouth, the hump was clapped on Billy's back. Now, said the king, be off, and if ever I find you here again, I will clap another hump on your front. And on that they all marched away with a great shout, and left poor Billy Begg standing where they had found him, with a hump growing from each shoulder. And he came home next day, dragging one foot after another, with a wizened face and as cross as two sticks, with his two humps on his back, and if they are not off, they are there still. That's the end of that one. And now for our second story of fairy mischief, the fairy child of Closny Lindney. One time there was a woman named Kalu in Closny Lindney, near Glen May, and she had a child that had fallen sick in a strange way. Nothing seemed wrong with him. Yet closer and closer he grew, ninging and neighing, night and day. The woman was in great distress. Charms had failed, and she didn't know rightly what to do. It seems that when about a fortnight old, the child, as fine a child of it for his age as you would see in a day's walk, was left asleep while the mother went to the well for water. Now herself got to put the tongs on the cradle, and when she came back the child was crying pitifully. And there was no quieting for him, and from that very hour the flesh seemed to melt from his bones, till he became as ugly and as wizened as a child you would see between the point of hair and the calf. He was that way his he was that way his whining howling filling the house for four years lying in his cradle without a motion on him to put his feet under him. Not a day's rest nor a night's sleep had the woman those four years with him. She was fairly scourged until there came a fine day in the spring, when Hombeg Bridson, the tailor, was in the house sewing. Hom is dead now, but there's many alive that remember him yet. He was wise tremendous, for he was going from house to house sewing, and gathering wisdom as he was going. Well, before that day the tailor was seeing lots of wickedness in the child. When the woman would set out for feeding the cows and pigs, he would be hoisting his head up out of the cradle and making faces at the tailor, winking and slicking and shaking his head and saying, What a lad I am! That day the woman wanted to go to the shop to sell some eggs that she had, and she says to the trailer, Oh man, keep your eye on the child that the boy won't fall out the cradle and hurt himself while I slip down the shop. When she was gone the tailor began to whistle low and slow to himself, 
as he stitched the tune of a little hymn. Drop that hombeg, said the harsh voice. The tailor, scandalised, looked around to see if it was the child had spoken, and it was. Whoosh, whoosh, now, lie quiet, said the tailor, rocking the cradle with his foot. And as he rocked, he whistled the hymn tune louder. Drop that hombeg, I tell you, and give us something light and handy, said the little fellow back to him, middling sharp. Ah, anything at all to please thee, said the tailor, whistling a jig. Hom, said the lad, can thou dance anything to that? I can, said the tailor. Can thou? I can at that, said the lad. Would thou like to see me dance? I would, said the tailor. Take that old fiddle down then, Hom, man, he said, and put the tune of the big wheel on it. Ah, I'll do that for thee, and welcome, said the tailor. The fiddle quits its hook on the wall, and the tailor tunes up. Hom, says the little fella, before thou begin to play, clear the kitchen for me. Cheers and stalls everything away. Make a place for me to step out to the music man. I'll do that for thee too, said the tailor. He cleaned the kitchen. He cleared the kitchen floor and struck up too near wheel war. In a crack, the little fella bounced up from his cradle with a choo. He began flying around the kitchen. Go it hom, face your partner, heel and toe, does it well done hom, more power to your elbow man. Hom plays faster and faster, till my lad was jumping as high as the table. With a choo, up goes his foot to the top of the dresser, and choo, then on top of the chimney piece, and choo, bang against the partition, and then he was half flying, half footing it around the kitchen, turning and going that quick that it put a reel in Tom's head to be looking at him. Then he was whirling everything around for a clear space, even Hom himself, who by degrees got up on the table in the corner and played wilder and faster as the whirling jig grows madder and swifter. Mm ye says the tailor, th throwing down the fiddle. I must run, thou not, thou not the child that was in the cradle, are thee? Holy man, thou's right enough, says the little fella. Strike up for me. Make haste, make haste, man. Keep jogging, ye ella. Whoosh, says the tailor. Here's herself coming. The dancing suddenly ceased. The child gave a hop, skip and a jump into the cradle. Go on with thy sewing, Hom. Don't say a word, said the little fellow, covering himself up in the clothes till nothing was left of him to be seen except for his eyes, which keeked out like ferrets. When herself came in the house, the tailor, all of a tremble, was sitting cross-legged on the round table and his specks on his nose and letting on that he was busy sewing. And the child in the cradle was grinning and crying as usual. What in all the earthly world? But it's the queer twitching all together. There's been going on here and me out. And how thou can see the needle in that dark corner, Hombrickson, let alone so, it baits me, said she, sliding in place. Well, then, well, well, then, well, well, on the bog he millish. What is, what is it all, at all, at all, that's going on on the ven? Did he think Mary had gone and left, left him then? The cheery? Mammy's going to feed him, though. The tailor had been thinking mighty with himself what he ought to do. So he said, Look here, woman, give him nothing at all. We'll go out and get a cree full of good turf and a wisp of fern. She brought the turf and throws a bundle of fern on it. The tailor gave a leap off the table down to the floor, and it wasn't long till he had the fine fire. Thou'll have the house put on fire for me, Hom, said herself. No fear, but I'll fire some of them, said the tailor. The child with his two eyes going out of his head watching to see what the tailor was going to do, was slowly turning his whining howl into a kind of call to his own sort to come and fetch him, it's like. I'll send thee home, said the tailor, drawing near the, the cradle, and he stretches out his two big hands to take the child and put him on the big red turf fire. Before he was able to lay hands on him, the little fella looked out of the cradle and took for the door. The back of my hand and the sole of my foot to you, he said. If I would only have had another night, I could have showed ye a trick or two more than that yet. And then the door flew open with a bang, as though someone had thrown it open, and he took off with himself like a shot. A hullabaloo of laughing and making fun was heard outside, and the noise of many running little feet. Out of the door the house goes herself and Tom after her. They see no one, but they caught sight of a flock of low-flying clouds shaped like gulls chasing each other away up Glen Rushen, and then came to their ears as if afar off from the clouds sharp whistles and wicked little laughs, as if making mock of them. Then, as they were turning round to come back, 
she suddenly sees right before her her own sweet rosy smiling child with thumb in mouth lying on the mossy bank and she took all the joy in the world of the child that he was back again safe and sound and that's our stories from the isle of man today i hope you enjoyed those see you next week for for dan's next uh, fairy stories thank you and good night